Good evening. This is the Board of Education meeting for which adequate notice under the Open Public Meetings Act was provided by written notice on January 8, 2018 to the Courier News, the Echo Sentinel, the Star Ledger, Tap and Warren, and the clerks of the Borough of Watchung and the townships of Greenbrook, Long Hill, and Warren. Can we have a roll call vote, Mr. Stiles? Ms. Barone? Here. Mr. Collins? Here. Mr. Mizio? Here. Mr. Fahey? Here. Mr. Hayek? Here. Mr. Hunsinger? Here. Hey. Mr. Martins? Here. Mr. Morrison? Here. Dr. Shabilsky? And Mr. Fallon? Yes. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, as we do it every time at this meeting, I'm going to entertain a motion to go into private session. Uh, the board will go into private session and be back so in moved. public session at 7.30. Uh, so can I have a motion in accordance with the provisions of the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act? Be it hereby resolved that the board move into executive session to discuss confidential personnel and legal matters after which action will be taken. It is expected that the matters discussed in executive session will be made public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Barry said so moved three Second. times. All right. <laughs> we'll be back at 730. Hit? We're back from public session just before we go into our agenda. I'm going to ask for a moment of silence for the victims in Parkland. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we've got a full meeting tonight. Uh, we're going to start following our agenda with the superintendent's comments. Thank you, Mr. Allen. So I am going, they, they will be coming up in a few minutes, but I'm going to give their, their a, a little introduction uh, for the guests we have here this evening. So I have the privilege of, privilege of introducing three of our staff members who have joined us this evening. Uh, Mrs. Julie Kumpf, who's our student assistance counselor, uh, Ms. Jill Gleason, and Ms. Jen Bassini, who are two of our health teachers. And you will hear in their presentation tonight how passionate they are about what they do every day, uh, about their support for our students, and the way that they've embraced um, our focus on student wellness, student and staff wellness, as part of our strategic plan. Um, so they're going to be sharing progress on that particular key element of our strategic plan, um, specifically our efforts to enhance social and emotional wellness within our community and reduce student stress. We've received very positive feedback on the new programs, and we look forward to the upcoming events designed to help students make healthy, sound choices that will benefit our learning community. So while the presentation will provide an overview of our recent district-wide events and instruction on substance abuse awareness and overall wellness, I want to briefly highlight the recent conversations that the administration, faculty, and students have had um, regarding student stress and how it can lead to poor decision making. Most recently, some of our older students described feeling pressure to succeed in a very competitive college admissions process and concerns that this pressure is leading some students to compromise their ac academic integrity have been raised. Though not a new issue in schools, advanced technology certainly complicates the matter. I would like to make clear that we take allegations of violations of our student academic integrity policy very seriously. Any claims that we do not thoroughly investigate alleged cheating violations and meet out strong consequences for those students who violate our policy and our code of conduct are willfully false. As a faculty and administrative team committed to a culture of ethical <coughs> responsibility, we are engaging in important conversations on how we can better teach students to respect and promote academic integrity. The Education Subcommittee of the Board of Education is going to be discussing the progress that our um, recently formed uh, Staff Integrity Committee has made so far um, at next month's Education Committee meeting. So that will be an agenda item on there and the Education Committee will report out on that at the, the next Board of Education meeting. We also can't emphasize enough the support, uh, that the support of our parent community is critical, and thus we encourage all of our parents to initiate conversations with your children about health, wellness, and ethical behavior. Okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. And following up on this superintendent's comments, uh, before the events of last week that have a lot of you here with the, the other allegations uh, that uh, had been made public concerning cheating, I want to emphasize a couple of things. 
we, as the superintendent indicated, certain allegations came to us. They, they were then investigated. And when they were investigated, it turned out that some of them were true, others were proved to be false, and yet others we couldn't substantiate one way or another. But we investigated it, we believe, thoroughly, and with the information that was developed in that investigation, we then treated the students involved appropriately under our integrity guidelines and the school policies. Uh, now we're going to move on to the business administrator's comments. I have no comments. Thank you, Tim. Uh, student representatives. And for those of you who don't know them, this, this is Emma, Gaff, Emma Gaffney and Eris Ulai. Ulai. Excuse me, Eric. So, photo and fine arts student uh, Ed Kai won the Scholastic Gold Award for one of his photographs. There were over 4,200 submissions for, from over 1,500 students, and about 30% of them garnered awards. The ceremony is on Thursday, February 15th, from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Montclair Art Museum. Senior Rachel Lee has received the distinctive honor of achieving the highest award in Girl Scouting, uh, the prestigious Girl, Girl Scout Gold Award. Her Gold Award project established a new Chinese storybook section in the Warren Township Library for young children and students of the language. Upon completion for the new section, Rachel hosted a Chinese myths read aloud program for children in grade kindergarten to three. Three of our seniors, David Cantone, Brady Pillsbury, and Andrew Roth have earned the rank of Eagle Scout, the highest award in scouting. A Boy Scout must demonstrate leadership, service, and outdoor skills and are required to do a service project that benefits the community. Student Valerie Wang participated in the Lancaster Archery Classic on January 26th and 27th, which is a well-known international archery event for both professional and amateur archers. Valerie earned fourth place. In August of 2017, Valerie won third place in the National Outdoor Championship and won gold in December of 2017 for New Jersey State. Senior Ultimate Frisbee players Allison Horesky and James Kennelly were invited to try out with the U.S. Under-20 national team on February 26th and 27th in North Carolina. Furthermore, 26 students from the Junior Statesmen of America Club representing all grades will be taking part in the Mid-Atlantic State Conference in Washington, D.C. this weekend. The Diversity Club has also been very active. The New Jersey Education Association will be filming their lesson to freshmen on Islamophobia and publishing it on their website. The club is also cooperating with the film club in order to produce a documentary about Watching Hill students. They will be interviewing students from all grades and backgrounds so that everyone can learn about the, their identities and the composition of the Watching Hills community. The Believe Club is also preparing for their March Madness basketball tournament on March 6th in Gym 7A. The Young Democrats Club hosted Democratic primary candidate for New Jersey's 7th District, Scott Salmon, where he articulated his platform as a millennial and then entertained questions on specific issues. The school also hosts our own Congressman Leonard Lance this Friday, where he will also explain his platform and then answer the questions of our future voters. On top of that, Democratic primary candidate Tom Malinowski um, for New Jersey's 7th District will be visiting our school on Monday, February 26th. On February 8th, the Watchung Hills Alliance Club, Project ILS, organized its annual talent show fundraiser. The Performing Arts Center at Watchung Hills was filled with students, parents, faculty, and community members as they were entertained by the 16 talented student acts. The enthusiastic crowd was treated with student performances that ranged from song, dance, rock bands, magicians, and a yo-yo artist. This very successful night not only highlighted the many talents of the students here at the high school, but raised awareness of ALS and generated over $1,100 for the cause. Friday night, February 9th, the class of 2021 held a Winter Wonderland dance. The students danced from 6.30 to 9 p.m. in gym 7, 8 and had a blast. This was the first major fundraiser for the class of 2021. The Interact Community Service Club is focusing their efforts on the following for February and March. They will be helping out Operation Smile, by, which provides cleft lip and palate repair surgeries to children worldwide. They are raising money by selling vinyl stickers as well as smiley faces to display on our bulletin board in the South Cafeteria. They will also be tutoring and helping out with the Urban Revival Project, in addition to working along South Plainfields Elementary Schools, building literacy and art programs through Community Connect. The All School Council is sponsoring random acts of kindness throughout the month of February. So far, we've collected food to donate to the Southbound Brook Soup Kitchen, as well as made cards for venerates. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in the pack, we will be holding our prom fashion show, sponsored by Prom Girl. Also, on May 3rd, the ISC will be sponsoring the Harlem Wizards and will be working with elementary schools to host assemblies on April 13th. 
50% of the proceeds will go to our charity of the year. Our Winter Warriors have had a very successful season. Our boys basketball team is 16 and 6, and we will be hosting the SCI AA quarterfinals on Tuesday, February 20th at 7 p.m. Congratulations to Dan Pillsbury for scoring his 1,157th point. He is now the all-time boys basketball record holder for points scored. The girls basketball team is 19 and 1 this year. We will be hosting the SCI AA quarterfinals on Tuesday, the 20th at 5:15 p.m. Our first NJSI AA sectional game will begin on Thursday, the 27th at 7. The boys' fencing team is 6-4, and, and the girls' fencing team is 8-4. and four. The fencing warriors are still in competition mode. They will compete in North Hunterdon on February 24th in the state tournament. Our wrestling team is 23-3. and three. Congratulations to Coach Dan Smith for being named 2018 Wrestling Coach of the Year. In addition to being the Somerset County Champs, this team has also captured the state sectional championship and the district championship. This is a first in school history. They continue their competitions that will finalize in Atlantic City the first week in March. Thank you. Did, didn't want to cut you off, him as I did last time. Uh, for, the, for the public, we're, we're thrilled that you're all here tonight. We know you're not all here just because of the wellness presentation, but it's an important presentation that's going to talk about the resources and programs he, here at the school addr addressing that issue. After, that, after the presentation is the first opportunity for public comment. And although uh, you could look different ways on, on whether uh, issues regarding coaching are on the agenda tonight or not, I'm going to treat them as a, a wellness issue, so we'll allow the comments during the first period for public comment after the wellness presentation. I want to welcome all of you here tonight, okay, along with the, the Board of Education. As Ms. Jew, uh, Ms. Jewett announced, um, I'm Jill Gleason, got Jen Bassini, and Julie Kumpf here. Um, we're, our main job right now is to update all of you on the different wellness initiatives that we have gone over and that we've done throughout the school year so far. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on wellness in general. That's kind of been our, our big mantra throughout the, the school year is getting not only the students involved, but also the other faculty in understanding what wellness is. Um, what we found when we, when we said the word wellness, the three of us up here, very passionate about it, and we take for granted that everybody understands what wellness means. Um, and a lot of people focused on just the physical wellness, so we wanted to make sure that they knew that it included the emotional wellness, the social wellness, the mental, the intellectual, and how that all um, plays out in our students and with our faculty. Um, as we started going through and making through the strategic plan, trying to come up with a plan to in, uh, improve the wellness programs that we had here, one of the things that we looked into is what else was going on in the rest of the country. We knew what we were seeing here. But just as a reminder of how we got to where we are now, um, we, you know, as part of our research, we realized that not only were we seeing kids under stress here, it was happening across the country, it's happening across the world. So, and at this point in time, studies are now being, uh, are out already that confirm that there have been changes in what kids are worried about these days and kids suffer with these days. Um, so that's um, just a reminder that this is something that's happening all over, not just in New Jersey or in uh, our high school. As I mentioned, uh, as a student assistance counselor, I work with kids individually, so I get to talk to them individually and hear about things. Teachers come to me with concerns about kids. Um, things really changed. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't see this level of anxiety and panic and depression. Um, it's really increased in the last five years. It increased uh, to the point that even in school here, it was being imp we were being impacted, kids were impacted because they were out of school for treatment more than ever. Um, they have inpatient and outpatient treatment. We've, um, a lot of kids have utilized those services. So we've seen it here for sure that kids, are, have, uh, uh, kids have changed in what their concerns are. Why are we seeing this increase? You know what, we're not experts up here and we don't know, everybody is an individual. And so there's all kinds of reasons why kids um, are more stressed than ever these days. Um, but you know what, they, they really have changed what they worry about. Um, you know, 10 years ago, kids didn't see their report cards maybe four times a year. Parents and kids saw their report cards periodically. They didn't check their, their grades every single day, all day long. Um, they were not quite as perfectionist as they are now. They're very, 
uh, they want to do well, they want to get into a good school, they want to get scholarships. Um, you know, the other things that you probably are well aware of, overscheduling, lack of sleep, these are things that are really uh, coming out in kids in terms of anxiety. Um, and when anxiety continues <coughs> without being treated, then depression can follow. So the kids, are, kids are very concerned these days. I see worry in ninth graders that I never saw before. Um, of course, social media, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons to social media, but there's more and more coming out that just the constant stimulation, as you can imagine, the isolation, you know, some of this, the articles remind us that we can be right next to our kid at home and they could be embroiled in a very intense uh, bullying situation or a something really intense to them and we don't even know it because they're home with us. Um, kids are staying in the house more than ever, but they are certainly communicating across the world. So that's been some of the stuff that we see uh, increasing their stress level. Some of the consequences that we're seeing school-wide, um, other than just the you know anxiety keeping them home with the, the poor school performance, so they're they're putting all this pressure in, they're taking a lot of these AP courses, um, but they're not able to, to fully succeed. And we're trying to look at more of the, the well-rounded individual, you know, not just the AP courses, but how are we going to then go on? Um, you can see on the last on the slide the difficulties transitioning into college and adulthood. Um, one of the things that we like to focus on, Jen and I and the other two health teachers, is that transition from high school where we have you know the the parent connection the the more dependence on the parents they are able to check the grades they're, they're talking to you know their their children a lot and how are they then going to go on and make that transition on their own um, we see a lot of the increased substance abuse so there to me there's a big connection um, on the increased substance abuse along with the increase of the, the depression and the anxiety and the stress that our kids are under um, and then overall physical and emotional health is being affected because of that, that same stress. Here is just kind of a representation of what wellness at Watchung Hills looks like. Um, if you look at the bottom of the pyramid is what we see that all of the students in grades 9 through 12 get. Um, so all students, one marking period per school year, will have health education, all right? And um, Jen Messini will go over specifics of the, the curriculum there. Um, we have our Healthy Edge, which is our wellness committee. You'll hear a little bit about what we're doing. And then you have a lot of additional resources that Jen will also be going over. Um, so that's school-wide. Every single student has health education throughout their time here. And then kind of that middle layer is any student that needs more one-on-one -on -one or individual counseling. So they have their guidance counselors, we have our student assistance counselors, we have our child study team, and then we have a new program here, Care Plus. And then we also have that top level on um, any student that we feel needs to go beyond what we can offer them at Watch on Hills, we have our external resources or the inpatient or outpatient treatment offerings for um, our students. So the health curriculum. One marking period um, a year. Uh, each, I'll go over briefly what each marking period is. Um, we do address wellness. In three of the four, grade 10 is driver's ed, so there is some, we do a lot of decision making and stuff like that, we talk about drugs and drinking in that, but most of the wellness goes on 9, 11th, and 12th. Um, there's a brief overview, ninth grade, uh, and this has evolved a lot, I've been here 20 years, so we're always you know, changing our health curriculum to meet the needs of the kids and what's going on in society. Um, mental health is a big part of our freshman curriculum. Freshmen are seeing first marking period. Um, and we go over everything from depression to suicide. Suicide or signs of suicide or the SOS program is a state mandated program as well. Um, within the mental health, we discuss um, how to help yourself, how to help friends, parent, uh, the coping skills. Uh, the SACs are very much part of our freshman curriculum because they come in and they introduce themselves. Um, they actually, this year we is, the, is one of the first years we, we are having all the, those extra resources in school to come in and to talk to each marking period as well just to um, give our kids exposure and let them know where they can go for help. Addiction is also part of the health curriculum in freshmen, uh, for freshmen. Decision making, the actual disease of addiction, and um, the alcohol and drugs part of it, and then uh, relationships as well, building healthy relationships, how to recognize a healthy relationship, and uh, respect and diversity and tolerance and knowing boundaries. That's pretty much what goes on um, during our freshman health. 
curriculum. Sophomore help is uh, second marker period. Like I said, a lot of it, a lot of it, we connect with um, drinking, drugs, driving, and responsible the responsibility overall, the the, the driving responsibility. Um, junior year, we we focus. Uh, they come in fourth marker period, and we focus on wellness. We go over the seven dimensions of wellness. We no longer just talk about physical wellness because of where we're moving. And uh, we talk about all the dimensions and we talk mostly about stress and stress management. Um, we happen to get them towards the end of the school year where a lot of them are starting or very much worried about the whole college process and have started you know, the SATs and all that stuff. So coping, we do stress um, management uh, like activities. Uh, like we shut down like the academic stuff and we do more fun things. We go out for walks sometimes and stuff like that. But we um, try to focus on all seven dimensions. We do go over nutrition and the importance of nutrition and sleep and all that stuff and, and incorporate that into the disease prevention and also a part of that is also um, emergency response which um, finishes out the junior curriculum. Senior curriculum is where we, uh, this year we've shifted more to this coping it, um, in the next transition and giving them uh, some coping skills with or working on coping skills is what we're kind of in the middle right now. They are third marking period. And um, we do uh, safety, decision making, um, independence, and some of the stress that comes along with that, um, leaving the nest and transitioning from high school to college. And, one of the things we're trying to focus on is allowing them and telling them that there is resources out there at the college level as well and um, bringing, well, I'll, on the next slide I'll explain what, who we bring in to kind of help with that as well. We go over grief and loss um, and uh, relationships and the, the, again the transitions that might occur and we have some booster programs that revolve around um, things that we've taught other years and stress will be part of that, you know, will reflect back onto the wellness that we did um, with juniors, and we'll also have been brought up already a lot of the mental health stuff that we did with them freshman year as well. <clears throat> so these are additional resources. This comes from the health <coughs> curriculum. We have the counselors come in, the guidance counselors, child study team, um, the student assistance counselors, and the care uh, plus has come in. They describe what they're doing, they're, what their purpose is here, where they're located, um, names, we have uh, all the health teachers have up in their, um, their rooms for those kids that don't want to actually talk sometimes. We have all their names up there with locations and who to talk to. We also have brought in a lot of guest speakers. Minding Your Mind is one of the ones that is a, a very powerful uh, group of uh, individuals. And most of the time with that stuff, we choose the kids who are what we consider young, in their 20s and 30s. Um, and uh, to come in and who have had uh, maybe problems that started in high school that they didn't recognize in high school and tailspin and um, got help while they were in college. Alcoholics Anonymous this year and last year we brought in and they too were young kids who, are, uh, who went through hard times, um, had their rock bottoms sometimes in, in high school or in college and they come and they tell their stories and they're quite powerful. And um, most of those two speakers are the two that would you agree with me that get most of the, the kids that stay after class, after the presentation, walk up and shake their hands and say thank you very much for coming. So we know that those two specific uh, speakers right now are hitting hard at home. And again, I, like Jill said, I think it connects to you know, a little bit of the drug problem that we're having and the mental illness problem that we're having. And kids can just recognize it and are proud of our speakers for um, being successful, but also are connecting either for a friend or for themselves. We have a new man coming in to, that we got through one of our um, driver's ed uh, seminars that we went to who's going to bring in talk about college safety, everything from being out on your own for the first time to some of the things that go on in college when you no longer have maybe the, the support of your, your community. And again, where to go and get that support at the college level. Nutritionists come in to talk about everything from the importance of eating and sleeping. And uh, Long Hill Rescue Squad does the, our CPR and stuff. And organ donation is coming in. And Consent 101. Consent 101 and college safety come together with all respect and um, expectations when you're dating and stuff like that and how to handle that and how not to feel pressure and what to say. So those are our guest speakers. Those are the ones that we get usually the uh, most powerful responses from the, ch uh, from the kids. And we ask them afterwards, positive, negative, do we bring them back? And we get some really good feedback. So. Our, kid, our kids and our students understand um, enough to help us, guide, to guide us and tell us what they need to hear. 
And then we also show certain um, documentaries um, the, that we have listed there that are everything from um, the mental illness stuff to the, the drug problems that are going on today in society. So the student assistance program, um, as Jen just mentioned, we're kind of like the next level of assistance. Everybody gets education and uh, activities and information, but then some kids need a more individualized situation. They need to speak to somebody. They need to be referred to somebody. Um, they just are having a bad day. So we have a student assistance program, which is, is well used. Um, this year we have two student assistance counselors, myself and Gwen Blake. We have Doug Graver from the Care Plus program. So there's three of us doing individual counseling of kids or group counseling, helping them with, indi uh, with individual issues. And you can see the services that we do there. We do counseling, we do crisis intervention. Um, we are a source of resources for the teachers uh, and the students. Teachers come to us all the time with questions about, uh, you know, a, maybe an individual student or a situation or how things should be done. We've put crisis, we are a source of crisis resource information and we put it on the website now so that people can go at any hour of the day and see how to find some local uh, emergency resources if they need them. Uh, but that happens during school all the time. People come and ask us for those kinds of information. Um, we do assessment and referral. Sometimes we'll talk with somebody and realize they need a more intensive treatment than we can provide and that's that top level that we saw on the pyramid. One of the main things I want to stress is that it is confidential and it's not part of students' records. A lot of times kids worry that colleges are going to know that they've talked to a counselor. So I, that's part of my opening spiel now. Colleges will not know. Um, we don't keep records on this kind of stuff. Um, it's confidential, but as with any counselor, if there was something uh, harmful or not unsafe going on, we would certainly notify somebody. But I always tell the kids we do that together. We figure out how we're going to notify and what we're going to do. We don't do it behind their backs or anything. Um, the kids come to the office often. Um, some kids maybe feel nervous about showing up at the office, but many, many, many don't. Um, they'll come, they'll knock on the door, they'll bring their friends. Um, you know, we make it as friendly as possible, as open door as possible. I run a lot of clubs and things and organ situations, so kids come in for all kinds of reasons. We work really hard not to embarrass any student, being well aware that they might be embarrassed. Um, we also try to reduce the stigma. Um, some kids don't have, don't worry at all about, you know, looking for services, and other kids are much more nervous about that. So, we, you know, we can work with the student in any way that makes them feel comfortable. Uh, kids walk in all the time. They email me at night if they if they have a problem and say, hey, you're busy tomorrow. So it works really well. We have flexibility. We all work together really well. We divide it up a little bit, but you know, we would never turn a student away if they were not in my end of the alphabet. Um, the, the issues that we're working with mostly and have been for the last five years are, are the ones listed on the bottom there. Um, but I think it's, a, um, I think that the, I think we have a, this is a great school. In my opinion, it's a great school in that the faculty supports these kind of services, the administration supports them, and it's, you know, the kids, I think, are, are feel comfortable using them for the most part. And if they don't, we can work on that one. Um, teachers, teachers contact me all the time. Um, maybe just questioning something they've read even in a, in a paper or something like that. So we're a source of, uh, of resource to the students and the parents and the faculty. So the Healthy Edge Wellness uh, Initiative is something I'm real passionate about. We've been working on it for a while. Um, things keep just growing and growing. I get emails daily from faculty members and, and people who have ideas on wellness. It's awesome. We're talking about wellness a lot more than we ever used to be. Um, we have the committee that meets monthly. That includes uh, faculty, some students, some parents. There's some changing year to year. We have seven subcommittees that are working on various aspects of the plan. This year, we've just gotten together a teen action group. So we've got a student subcommittee now, which kind of happened on its own. Some kids went to um, a leadership camp over the summer and came back and said, hey, we, we want to get a part of this wellness thing. We want to help reduce stigma, help kids learn how to cope. So we, we folded them into our group right now. Um, and they'll be coming to our meetings and, and having our support. Some of the other things are listed there. We got This year was the year we did get some of the wellness day situations going. We had a flex day. We had challenge day or curriculum, wellness in the curriculum. Um, we're continuing the day in the life of a student where faculty members follow a student around. We continue to offer some really great professional development to staff in terms of wellness things. It's been, we've had wonderful opportunities this year. And then there's some other, there's some physical things going on. They got a free yoga class for, kit, for people. 
Um, and then the, uh, the ASC is sponsoring all kinds of things that contribute to wellness this year. Uh, it just happens to be Random Acts of Kindness Month this year. So we're seeing a lot of things go on. We're, we're, um, you know, our goal is pretty much to give people opportunities in education, opportunities to learn about wellness and take advantage of it and education about it. Uh, so we've got a lot of different things going. Okay, and then one last part of this Healthy Edge um, series that we're running. Um, some of you in attendance here may have been at the Chris Heron night that we had back in January. Um, we've really this year, it's been a passion of, of all of ours up here and it's been something that um, school-wide everybody has seemed to embrace and it's, it's something that we're so excited about. You know, other teachers laugh and, and how much we work on this and you know, it's something that we do sleepover and it's, it's definitely something that we are really focused on and student knowledge important faculty knowledge important um, from up here the parent perspective is huge as well um, so we started some series going on like I said January was the Chris Heron we have a big night coming up on March 6th right where it's going to be focused more on our substance abuse issues um, what we like about that is kind of this community conversation where it doesn't have to be, it's, it's the prevention. It's before my son or daughter may go down this route. What do I need to look for? Um, who might be experiencing this? And it does tie in a lot to the mental health because a lot of this increase that we're seeing in the drugs and alcohol is because of the, the pressure and the anxiety and the stress. So that's gonna be on March 6th. Julie and I are part of the panel. Um, Mike Robertson, the Somerset County prosecutor, will be part of the panel. And then there's also gonna be two young individuals sharing their personal story, one of which our seniors have seen um, just last week. Um, so he'll be sharing his story. He also runs a community outreach program um, and is now a leader of, of support in this. And then with the PTO, the PTO has been phenomenal always, but this year I finally have had the opportunity to work hand in hand with them. Um, and they have also been super supportive in trying to get um, the wellness initiative out there. And on April 12th, we're going to run a parent night with the Mind Your Mind organization that Ms. Bassini talked about. Um, and coming for our students. They're gonna be presenting to parents the signs to look for. So it's gonna be a personal story along with what do I do as a parent? How do I see the signs? What do I do? How do I start a conversation? Julie and I and our uh, Mary Allen Fell and our Director of Curriculum Instruction, we were part of a, a Hillsborough night where it was centered around how to start this conversation. How do we, um, you know, engage our students, not just how was your day, you know, but engage conversation, get them to talk about it. Because a lot of them feel like they can't talk about it. Parents don't know really know where to start. Um, so that's really the, the message behind this community conversation. And again, the March 6th night is going to be centered around the drugs and alcohol. And then the April 12th is going to be centered around the mental health. And it's something that we're hoping to continue, not just for the rest of this school year, but continuing into next school year as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do any board members have any questions? I just had one question about um, like technology and using cell phones and safety with use of that. Is that something that you guys deal with or is that something that really they've dealt with more at the middle school level? We, and we do talk a little bit about it freshman health but it is more of a middle school, the internet safety. Um, when we focused more, it used to be, I think two years ago, mm -hmm. kind of transitioned out because some of the other stuff was coming up and um, they do a base, we do like a basic safety, not in, you know, internet and know your boundaries and, um, you know, but not so much like predator stuff and things okay. like that. But because they do get that at the middle school level. And again, that comes from the kids. You know, what do you think, you know, and it's kind of evolved. So. Bob? Um. Uh, last year, this board spent a lot of time looking at the Care Plus program, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously, in, and given the budget environment last year, it was difficult to do, but the board felt that it was a priority to find a way to make that program come to life for this year. Um, could you kind of maybe highlight some of the impact that that program has, has had for us? I think it's been great. Uh, as one of the counselors here, we have another person now available to, to see kids individually, and we, we certainly have the use for that. Um, we've been able to, Gwen Blake and I have been able to kind of, we split the alphabet and we work, but then there's some kids that really need a more, can benefit from 
a more intensive contact with a counselor and having it here in school has been wonderful. Some kids are so busy and so whatever, they could not get to an outside counselor. So this has been really wonderful to have uh, somebody here who's got a little bit of time, he's got a, a space. Um, it's been well, we've worked really well in terms of referrals back and forth. Uh, it's been a good support, I would say. And, and that's one of the reasons why we have all of them coming into every marking period to talk about what their role is in the school. Because when Care Plus first came in, I. Those, that first month, it was a little like, what, what is this new resource we have? So we realized we needed to get out this message and say, he's, he's part of you know, the student resources when you, when you have stress for. He focuses a lot, too, um, on having an open um, room to go to at lunchtime when a lot of the kids, that's their only free time, to go and just talk with friends and, and hang out and bring up some issues, so uh, it's really important right now, or one of the goals we have is that by the end of the school year, every group, every health class, every marking period, every grade level will know exactly what his role is in the school. I think the only other point that I would like to add is with a lot of the prevention series, it's, it's hard to put a, a number on his worth or, you know, his comfort, his Blake's worth, but I think a lot of the prevention is how many lives are we saving? Like, so we never may see the other side of it. It's more of, you know, who are we saving? Who is he talking to? Who are they talking to before it gets to the part where we're actually seeing, um, I don't know the proper word, but the, the more nipping it in the bud before it gets to the part. We're, we're actually um, meeting with the program director tomorrow, and one of the questions that I had for her was how do we evaluate the effectiveness of a program like this because it's really the absence of things that right. are the effectiveness of it. So we're go I wanted to, to ask her exactly what things we should be looking at for me to come back to the board and say this is a worthwhile investment to continue. One of the areas I thought also was about the um, step down from the outpatient or the mm -hmm. inpatient that they do when they come mm -hmm. back. There'd be a transition someplace where the mm -hmm. Care Plus could help us with that transition so mm -hmm. students feel like when they come back from the program like that, mm -hmm. that they still have support. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'd like to know yeah. that, like, ha I mean, obviously we just started in this September. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many children actually yes. that's occurred yes. to. Yes. So, mm -hmm. I mean, but that would be and one of the issues. And starting to happen now. There are some coming back, and it's Right, it's been a nice place to be able to transition. Julie, can you also just speak to the web page that um, did just recently go live, and it's going to be linked in the upcoming newsletter? But if you can just talk a little bit about the resources that the would crisis be resources, yeah, we, um, you know, what a lot of times people don't know what to do in an emergency or what is an emergency and how would that even work. So what we uh, we have always had that kind of information available and share it, but it's on the website now, so that if somebody were at some, you know, any 24/7, you could go on our website, or if you're not sure what to do, you could start there there's a link to crisis resources right on the front page with quick links um, and through guidance and it really gives you a little bit of explanation of uh, what constitutes a psychiatric emergency what you would do in a psychiatric emergency what your options there's also a list of local resources for counseling and family services and things like that so we wanted to make sure that that was available and accessible to people even if you know the buildings closed so um, we made sure and we'll keep it updated so that people can have information if they need it and there's a, a big portion of the the newsletter coming out the community newsletter that I send out um, that Julie um, wrote a, a large piece in it about everything that we're doing and the resources available and we're highlighting the uh, the resources on the website in that yeah. thank you very much thank you Julie, you guys don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting. You're excused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fallon? Yes. Uh, before we move on, on, it's kind of tangential to this. Um, last Wednesday, uh, I was in a chat with a friend of mine who is a faculty member uh, down at Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Uh, during that afternoon, uh, we all know what happened at this school. Uh, this particular teacher had 40 of her students that went into that building that morning, and only 39 of them came home. The one that did not come home was Gina Montalto. Gina was a 14-year-old freshman. She was a color guard member, and she was buried this morning. It is uncomprehendable what the parents 
and the families have to go through in that situation. And it's unimaginable that as a board member that we see these same things and have these same responsibilities here. Uh, as a parent, I often think, are we doing enough to protect our students? Uh, just as a parent, will my student be safe when they walk into their building, whether it's here on this campus, in, in our school, or in campus at college? And I've often wondered whether we are. But um, I'm heartened by the fact that this administration and this board uh, has worked very collaboratively with our law enforcement officials to make sure that we have a facility that is very well designed, very well protected, with great strategies in place uh, to ensure that we have thought as much of everything as we can to keep our students safe and protected. Uh, I did speak with uh, Chief Kane at the Warren Township Police Department uh, earlier this week. Uh, just to make sure that I had the confidence that we were doing all the things that we should be doing. Uh, and I am confident that we are, both things that the public knows about and things that the public will never know about. Uh, but I think it's important in this environment and given the most recent incidents down in Florida that the public is aware that this administration, this board, has taken this very, very seriously We've invested a lot of time, energy, and funds to make this building safe for our students, and we are continuing to work with the authorities to look at new ways to ensure that when you send your children to this school, that they are coming home. Thank you. And I, I will just very briefly piggyback. We're fortunate at this school. The, the, there's always been a very good relationship with the Warren Police Department for as long as I've been on the board, the last three police chiefs have all worked very closely with the administration here. Uh, Chief Keene continues to work closely with the administration here. Uh, we've got an agenda item on tonight where we're approving uh, a memorandum of understanding with the police department that was shepherded through by the Somerset County prosecutor that will allow for, if, if there is any sort of incident that goes on will allow for live streaming from our video cameras directly to the Warren Township Police Department, only to be used in emergency situations. But it's an example of the things that Bob was talking about, the kind of cooperation that our administration has demonstrated with the Warren Township Police and the board's dedication to keeping this building as safe as we can for all of us. And now I want to thank everybody for their courtesy through the wellness presentation. We're going to open it up for public comment. This is my 11th year on this Board of Education, and you are the biggest crowd I've ever seen, even when we went through the building referendum and everything else. So therefore, uh, the, all of our opportunities for public comment are limited to, to five minutes per person. I'm going to ask you to please observe that. I see we've got a lot of people, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to comment. Uh, come up, give your name, give the town you live in, and talk to us for five minutes. Anyone wish to, pub to comment? Come on. I'm a junior at Watching Hills, and I play football for the Warriors. I felt compelled to speak to you tonight due to the sudden departure of Coach Sorber. If there's any way that anyone here could help bring him back to coach at Watching Hills, my fellow teammates and I would greatly appreciate it. I have played football my whole life, and I came here due to great academics and to be with my friends. Coming here, I knew there wasn't much success in football, and many people could say we would never win. Freshman year, we could barely field a team, and I was being told that there may be no freshman team. I was begging all my friends to play, and in spite of the adversity, we fielded a team and got beat up every game. But even with no wins and a great deal of pain each week, I still had fun because I loved the sport. When Coach Soiber came to Watching Hills, many things changed. We quickly began working harder on getting in shape, learning football, and creating a brotherhood of players that all encourage each other to improve. Due to these changes, we are seeing a growth in the participation of the football program and seeing increased success last year. 
It felt great to beat Ridge and Hunter and Central when people told us we can never beat those teams, but we succeeded. The players and I appreciate all the coaches that helped us. Watching Hills does not have to be losers in football or any sport. <coughs> what we need is the same support that teams like Westfield get to be successful. Their players are no better than us, but they have been given the right coaches and support. It may just be a game, but if done right, the student athletes learn much more about life and becoming respectful young men with integrity. With the right pieces in place, we strongly believe as a team that continuity is pivotal to our success and safety, and that starts with the head coach. Please help us continue our success. Thank you for your time. Always a warrior. Kevin Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Drews. I'm from Warren. I'm a junior at this high school. I've been playing football for this school since I was a freshman. And this year, by far, was my favorite year. Not because of the coaches or the players, but because of the progress we made. This year, we made the playoffs for the first time in a while. And since my freshman year, I've had to learn three different playbooks. And now for my senior year, I'm going to have to learn a fourth. Four playbooks in four years is not how you win a state championship. Look at, West, look at Westfield. They've won three state championships in three years. And that's consistency. They have had their coach there for 11 years and have been using the same playbook every year. That's also consistency. <clears throat> for a freshman football player at Westfield, he learns their playbook, and by his senior year, he has mastered it. So that's something that has not happened at this school. We go from one playbook to another. You don't see this in academics. The course curriculum does not change drastically every year. To me, sports are more important. To me, sports are as important as school is. I try to work as hard as I can in school as I do in football. I don't see students sharing lockers other, with other students in school, so why should the freshmen share lockers in the locker room for the whole summer training? And that's how kids get sick. Now you guys did fix that problem, but it shouldn't take the whole football community to speak up to get that done. What I'm asking is for the Board of Ed to back up all athletic teams and help them bring a state championship home to the school. And, change the co and changing the coaches every year and not having a clean and safe locker room is not how we're gonna win a state championship. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Shabilsky from Warren um, to touch on the subject of um, safety and anxiety um, after what happened in Florida in one of my daughter's um, freshman classes the teacher and the students were talking about ways that they could make themselves safer here at Wachung Hills and the topic of the breezeways came up um, my daughter's nervous now because she knows that uh, somebody with a backpack could walk in during any change of class because that's open to the uh, parking lot. And also, um, she found out today that that breezeway is open for the entire lunch period. Um, so one, I can I pause you for one second? I don't know if anyone else from the media is here besides uh, Ms. Nemchek. I'm just gonna ask if you wouldn't mind to, to you can continue, but to just not include this per, these particular details if that's okay, thank you. Just because it has to do with school security, so I want to be okay. able to have the discussion. I just don't want to be worried that as we're talking about something sure. well, as a vulnerability. I don't know if you thought yes. about that before, but uh, I did want to bring it up if it um, was not on the agenda. Thank you for that. Thank Great, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Jeff Ostroff. I live in Warren Township. Uh, moved into the township in 1990. I have a uh, older daughter who graduated in 1997 from the high school. Older son who graduated in 2003. I uh, have a son who's a freshman right now in the high school. He played on the freshman and JV team. He was a kicker. I'm going to talk about academics, sports, and character. And indulge me a little, I'm gonna give a little history lesson too, but I will not take up the full five minutes. His name was Hobie Baker, and he was an American legend and hero. In 1910, Baker enrolled at Princeton University as a member of the class of 1914. He played varsity football and hockey over the course of his Princeton career. 
During the 1911 football season, Baker scored 92 points, a school record that lasted until 1974. Princeton finished the 1912 season with seven wins, one loss and one tie, and nine games. The 1911-1912 hockey team finished with eight wins and two losses. Baker was named captain of the football team in 1913, his senior year. Over his three-year football career with the Tigers, Baker scored 180 points, a school record that lasted until 1964. In hockey, he was considered the greatest collegiate player of his time. He is the only individual to be inducted into both the college, hockey, and football Hall of Fames. In 1916, he joined the Civilian Air Corps to fight in World War I before the United States had joined. He took place in deadly air battles over France in 1918, after the war had ended and he had received his papers to come home. He died in an airplane accident at the age of 26 over France. But Hobie's influence extended far beyond the printed page. Through his Spartan example, he imposed a code of behavior on athletes, particularly college athletes, that was accepted, if not faithfully observed. For the better part of four decades, in the Hobie Code, for example, a star player must be modest in victory, generous in defeat. He credits his triumphs to teamwork, accepts only faint praise for himself. He is clean cut in dress and manner. He plays by the rules. He never boasts, for boasting is the worst form of muckery. And above all, he is cool and implacable, incapable of conspicuous public demonstration. The Hobie Code, unspoken for to speak of it, would be another form of muckery, was far-reaching in its time. Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio observed it. So did Joe Lewis and Rocky Marciano. Niall Kinnock, the 1939 Heisman Trophy winner, who also died young, embodied it. Roger Staubach adhered to it, and also, for all his flair, to Julius Irving. In 1981, the Hobie Baker Memorial Award was given for the first time to college hockey's most outstanding player and now has become a yearly tradition. Character matters. Teamwork, dedication, integrity, exceptional play, humility, and above all, character. These are the values that set the game of hockey and those who play it apart from others. They also are the values that Hobie Baker honors each year. The Hobie Baker Award is given to the top NCAA men's hockey player in the nation. Winners are chosen not for just raw skill or stats or character alone, though these are important. They are selected for everything they do. Candidates must exhibit strength and character both on and off the ice, contribute to the integrity of the team, display outstanding skills in all phases of the game, show scholastic achievement and sportsmanship. It is is it our goal to create an environment that perpetuates and, and at any cost number chasing achievers? Is there any room for the future Hobie Bakers of the world at Watchung Hills? Is there any room for our future leaders at Watchung Hills? Are we going to leave them to the private schools and our other public schools? Are we not going to teach service? Are we not going to teach our children how to succeed in an ethical manner? Are we not going to teach our children how to be responsible participants as they go out in the world? We need to teach failure, doing ethical hard work is better than success, taking the easy immoral path. A culture of ethical responsibility can be taught through a combination of academics and sports. We can do better and it starts with better support for both the academic and extracurricular programs at Watch Young Hills. The parents of the football team members request a meeting between our representatives and representatives of the board and the business office to discuss a path forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Greg Drews. I'm a Warren resident. I have two children at the high school now. I have two more kids that will be coming to the high school. My eight-year-old's in the back of the room. I'm here as a concerned parent. 
I'm concerned because there is a perception that the board in the school is not interested or supportive of the student athlete, especially the football team. That is a common perception that's out there in the public. I'm not going to recite all the benefits of sports or football, but it certainly teaches these children ethics and integrity, teamwork. The school now is, is going on their third coach in four years. We certainly need consistency. We also need more coaches. There was a shortage of coaches. These kids are here on different shifts because the coaches have to devote time to the freshmen and the upperclassmen. Now there is a reason to keep the freshmen separate from the upperclassmen, I get that. But there was also a reason they kept them separate because there wasn't enough coaches. As parents, we're running around like crazy. The kids are running around like crazy with the different schedules. There's a lot of dedication and hard work that goes into this, not only by the kids, but by the parents. Our vacation schedules are dictated by what's going on with sports. Generally, we get about a week that we can do our vacation. Otherwise, these kids are expected to be at practice and participating. I'm not here to make demands or threats. I'm here as a concerned parent and you can see there's a lot of concerned parents and a lot of concerned players. We're all frustrated and we're all upset. Again, the dedication that these kids put in is tremendous and they're, they're looking for your support. They're looking for your help. We all are. The kids have put in a lot of hard work and we need to keep that going. The culture has changed. These kids care. These kids are working hard and they're playing as a team. They're going to weightlifting three days a week. I hope they continue to do that and you each show the leadership that you all have. I hope there's someone from the school that will step up and help guide them. But if nobody steps up, you guys have to do it on your own. Don't stop the progress. My son mentioned to me, well, who's going to know whether we show up for weightlifting or not? Why is it going to matter? You will know. Doing the right thing doesn't mean other people have to know about it. You guys do the right thing. The athletic budget. I have no idea what it is, but how does the athletic budget compare to similar schools? Are we right in line? What are we spending on athletics, not just football? And I understand football takes up a large percentage. And I understand there's only so much money to go around. And if we keep saying we want this, we want that, our taxes go up. I understand that. I have a very large family, and there's only so much that goes around you have to make do. But what can we do with the other sports so that we're all working in concert, the other coaches, the other teams? My kids not only play football, they play other sports. So if you take from one, you've got to take away from the other. I get it. But has there been any thought about having a committee where all the coaches are trying to brainstorm so that the limited budget can be spread out as far as possible. What is spent by Westfield? What is spent by Scotch Plains family? What is spent by Montgomery, Ridge, Bridgewater, North Hunterdon, Phillipsburg, East and South Brunswick? These are all similar schools. What is their budget? How many coaches do they have? Because we certainly don't have enough football coaches. The safety of our kids are important. Without enough coaches and without enough supervision, that's a formula for disaster. <laughs> coaches' salaries. What are the other towns paying? What can we do to have consistency and keep the coaches here? They have a tremendous benefit. I mean, look at all these football players here. They care. They're expecting you guys to show that you care too. Basically, how do we stop the bleeding? What can we do to make things better? What can we do to keep coaches, have qualified coaches, and keep the program, all the sports programs, running in the right direction? <clears throat> Boys, it's not about winning. It's about hard work. Show everybody that you guys can do the hard work. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Mark Claxton. I'm, I'm sorry. Mark Claxton, I live in Warren. I have four kids in the system from five-year-old 
pre-K all the way up to uh, uh, sophomore in high school. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Greg and I coached together for many years. I agree with Greg a thousand percent. You guys coached a bunch of you. You got to put the hard work on. Until this thing gets worked out, you have to put the hard work in. You don't need anybody at this point. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So this yeah. is public comment to the board. So. All right, no problem. So I'm here to talk to the board tonight. It's been an emotional night uh, with the scandal, and it's been an emotional week with the loss of several coaches, one specifically in Coach Soybert, which has molded a lot of young men in this room. Uh, so each of you has been entrusted by the community uh, to create a safe and nurturing environment that will give our kids the ability to succeed in academics, athletics, and or both. We've come now come to a crossroads where each and every one of you and us as parents, coaches, and teachers need to make a decision that will change our trajectory or trend and focus on how can we make this school better? What can we do to make our kids or our children succeed? The current events that have been put upon us aren't good. The academic issues, the athletic issues, current athletic issues, uh, basically just shows that we have not been doing our job as a community. We're all accountable for this, board members, faculty, and parents. We all need to look in the mirror and, and work towards change. Board members, work to put our kids in the best possible situation for growth and success. Coaches, teachers, be the mentors that you're supposed to be. Go the extra mile for that kid that needs help in school. Go the extra mile for that athlete that might need that little bit of push to make them a better player. Parents, don't look the other way. Make your kids accountable for their actions. Praise when needed. Follow through on promises and enforce consequences when necessary. So what I'm asking of the board tonight is a promise to go the extra step. Be proud of, uh, of a future that you can create for our kids in both academics and athletics. They both go hand in hand. Don't settle, don't have a check the box mentality. Fight for causes that you believe in. You've been put in these seats for a reason. Try not to let numbers get in the way. I know it's difficult, but try not to let those numbers get in the way. Think about the big picture. Aspire to do the right thing day in and day out. And if you get tired, please step aside and let somebody with more passion step in and do the job and take the lead. Our school, our community, and most importantly, our kids deserve it. So thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else want to come up? Hi, my name is Stacy Cosner, and um, I wanted to speak to the board. I'm certainly concerned and feel for the football program and the loss of the coaches. Stacy, could you just tell us what town you're from? Oh, sorry, I'm from Warren, Thank and you. I have a daughter in the school. But I'm also concerned about the integrity and reputation of our school, given the allegations that have been made public about the cheating scandal. I don't have the facts. Um, I understand that you have privacy concerns and you're dealing with minors, and I don't know how much of it you can address, and I did appreciate your comments. But I think that something needs to be done publicly, maybe to allay some of the rumors and the false statements, if they are in fact false, that are being made public. It's painting our school in a very poor light. I think there's a lot of concern amongst the community about how our school will be perceived in the broader scope with um, colleges and just in, in the world at large when you have people who are vocally coming out and saying that our school is covering things up and, and all of this. And as I said, I have no knowledge of whether or not any of this is true, but I think that there are a lot of parents who are concerned about how our school is being perceived and the integrity of our school. So I'd appreciate if the board could at least whatever could be made public, um, be made public to address those concerns. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. Um, Jerry Aranio. I'm a Long Hill resident. I'm uh, a proud graduate of Watching Hills and a proud parent of a sophomore football, sophomore football player at Watching Hills. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening to us this evening. Um, I'm going to try not to be redundant. I had some prepared stuff. I might refer to that in a second. But basically what I want to say is um, you guys are doing a great job. We know that. It's not here. We're not here to be combative. We're not here to challenge you or criticize you in any way. But what we do want is some answers. Um, there's been a colossal failure in the football program for decades. And I don't think that this town or this community deserves this. Um, it's not your fault. It's not our fault. It just happened. What I want to know is why it happened. I'm sure lots of people want to know that. What we have to do is have a well thought out process of hiring the next coach. Don't just grab the next guy that is a gym teacher and throw him in there and say you're the football coach. I hate to sacrifice any student body, any year, any grade level, but we have to do it right. We had a great coach, somehow he slipped by. Everybody seemed to love Rich Soybert. All the students loved him, all the parents loved him. I don't know what the board members thought of him, but we heard there was some friction. That's what I hear as a parent. That has to go away. We can't have that friction. When we find this out after the fact, I don't know if any parent that found out during the, <coughs> during Rich's tenure that there was friction with him in the board. We've heard that the board did not deliver what he asked for, whether it was money, and it's, we're talking about small dollars. You guys, what's the budget? What's the budget this year? What are you guys uh, pushing? About 36 30 million? million. 36 million? 40. 36 40. million dollars. I heard we're fighting over 46. 40, 46? I, oh. $46 million, that's like ridiculous. That's what, up $10 million over the last 10 years? Jerry, don't even talk about money when you don't know what our fixed costs are. Okay, you know I understand. Thank, well. you. thank you, Lisa. Stuff. That's why I said I'm not here to criticize, but I'm just saying the numbers are colossal. The failures are colossal also. So what's happening here is we're fighting over $3,000 for, uh, for quasi-volunteer coaches. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Some of these guys are going to talk about the business side of it. I don't, sorry for not knowing all the numbers, but some of these coaches are making stipends of like $3,000. Okay. What what person would work for three thousand dollars? Seriously, I mean, I'm not saying you, you know you guys know me. Some Lisa, you know me. Chris, you know me. People from Long Hill know me as a budget hawk like no other from, from Long Hill Township. I'll rip out any dollar out of the budget that doesn't belong there. But when you have to sacrifice a program for three thousand dollars, to me, there's a problem. Somebody has to look at this. You have an army of volunteers over here as parents that have the knowledge they're willing to help you. What they told me last night was that they have raised private money and they don't have the authority to spend it on the football program. That it has to go through the administrator, uh, Timothy. Is that, is that the case, Timothy? Do we have to go through you to spend money? Uh, um, we're here to hear public comment, Jerry. Okay. Sorry about that. We ask questions, but from what I heard last night was that, that, the, that the touchdown club does not have the authority to allocate their own resources, to allocate their own funds. If that's the case, I have, I'm going to find that out one way or another. I want to know if that's state law, if that's school policy. <laughs> or if that's even true. I don't even know if it's true. But if it is true, we have to find out the, the, the ways that we can support the program financially. Obviously, there's some, there's some issues here. So what I would ask from you is that we have some type of process that the board can work directly with the touchdown club or whatever 501c3 is, is the appropriate organization to work with to avoid this kind of stuff in the future. Specifically the, the finances, not the coaches. I, I trust that you'll put together a great uh, subcommittee to find the next best coach in the universe, right? We're gonna do that. But can you include the parents also? Can you include a subsection of them? They asked for that. That's what people wanna do. Like I said, you guys are great volunteers your plates are full of all kinds of other things. Like Lisa, you have the budget to worry about right now, right? You guys have all this stuff. You have people willing to help. Is there a process that we can start that they can help? That's my ask for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to come up? Public comment? My name is 
name's Kathy Saunders. I'm from Greenbrook, and I currently live in Warren. <clears throat> and I did not plan on speaking tonight, but my son just texted me and asked me to come up here. <laughs> I'm a proud mother of a freshman running back. I have a son in high school, college. He did not attend Watchung Hills. I chose to send him to St. Joe's. Uh, it was a great choice, very happy to send him there, great school. And Kyle was slated to go to St. Joe's. And we had a house fire. Um, my son was in the fire. I won't bore you with that whole story. But Kyle was in the, in the fire. And due to the circumstances, he was hurt. His um, mental state was pretty hurt, so I allowed him to come here. And I have to say, two, two Markham periods in, losing Coach Soiberg, my son is crushed, crushed, crushed. Um, yeah, and I understand. The fire happened June 3rd. Kyle could not attend the um, football weekend in East Stroudsburg. He was still hurt from the, his injuries. He was not cleared to go. The first day of practice, Coach Soiberg introduced himself to Kyle and really took him under his wing. My son was a damaged bird. Um, he lost everything, all his memorabilia, everything in his room. And Coach Rich took my son, a non-football play player, and turned him into a football player. How you can allow that man not to still be here coaching these boys is just beyond me. How you allowed him to walk out this door for whatever small amount of money it was. How you don't care about these boys. You have these women here. They did a wonderful job on this wellness committee. A wonderful job. Let's talk about their wellness. All right? These are young men. They, there's so many concerns for them. The suicide rate is so high. Alcoholism, drug abuse, everything. But Coach was there for them. He made sure they went to study hall every day. He talked to them about drugs. He made them go to the weight room. He was such a mentor to them. You have no idea. When I picked my son up last week, he got in the car. He was crushed. The coach sat him down to say he was leaving. Crushed. I just don't get it. I don't get it. In this day and age, in the world that we live in, how you can let a man walk away from these boys is just, I'm speechless. I really am speechless. I hope you can find it to sit with him, talk to him. Do what you can to get him back. These boys need him. They really honestly do. Um, I have nothing else to say. Anyone else want to come up? I'm going to close public comment uh, at this point. As I said, I've been a board member here for 11 years. Board members here are very disappointed that the coach has decided to resign. We're not happy with the situation that we've had three coaches in the, in the last four years. There are things that we will try to do about it. Some of the things, some of the things that were asked for, information about what our budget is for athletics, that's public information and we'll provide it and we will help provide information on what other schools spend, spend as well. And, and so you can compare and, and see what it is. We're asked to spend more, con more money on assistant coaches. What everybody has to understand and what we've attempted to explain to Coach Soybert is that's a matter of collective bargaining with the union that represents our teachers and coaches here. We don't have flexibility to just throw more money at the people because it would be easier to get the more people out to coach because it's not in accordance with our collective bargaining agreement. So those are restrictions that we have to comply with. Now having said that, okay, we talk, some of the people ask questions about raising money. I spent an hour and a half before tonight's meeting at one of the committees that, that we formed looking at alternative financing. And it's a group of, of board members and administrators who've been meeting with people from the booster clubs and looking at ways 
not just to include, increase what the booster clubs are able to raise, but looking for other sources of money that might be able to fund programs and athletics here. So we are looking at things and, you know, other questions that were asked about what has to be approved, I just don't want to answer them tonight because I don't want to give an incorrect answer. But we understand your concerns. I appreciate all of you have come out and, and how respectful and you've been tonight in expressing your viewpoints. I think the board has heard you. We'll have more to say, but as I say, unfortunately, we are disappointed too that the coach decided to resign. Thank you. Can I just, um, given the, I'm not going to address, I just want to, in, in terms of the notes I took, so I heard Westfield, right? That came up like three or four times. I think that's important to have that information. Um, the booster club coordinating with each other and if that what Peter just talked about and that financing, I think that needs to be explained even more the next time we come in and explain exactly what the purpose of that was <coughs> and the concerns that Tim has with regard to that and what the board was trying to do before this all happened in order to create a fair way of taking the money that's that is fundraised and 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 make sure that all sports are funded as well as we can fund them. Um, I heard some safety concerns. I think we I, I would like some information about the locker room safety. Is that uh, is that an actual safety concern that's that exists or not? Um, is the number of coaches a safety concern? I know that there are. I remember when we went through the club and bargaining agreement. There are a certain amount of coaches that are even allotted to each sport. Is that my understanding, right? Um, and are they all filled? And um, why aren't they filled? I think that's an important information that needs to get out there. Um, I think a thoughtful coach selection process is a great idea. Um, and um, in terms of the budgeting, you, Peter talked about how we can explain exactly how much money is spent on sports. Um, and then this whole idea about the touchdown club allocating its own funds, I think we need to address that in, next time as well. And if we, I think if all that information is provided, maybe people will be, have a better understanding of exactly what the board and the administration has been doing. Yeah, and as I said, Rita, I didn't want to take a chance of giving incorrect information. Right. No, I'm just saying these are the issues that I heard yeah. that I think need to be addressed. <laughs> Thank you. At this point, we're going to move on to our agenda items. You're more than welcome to stay, but if you don't want to stay, that's fine too. Thank you. Pete. Peter. Peter. I'm sorry. Five minutes? Yeah, five minute, five minute break, board members. I'm not sure 
Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I took yours. I wrote on mine. Here. This is definitely mine. It has green notes on it. That's good, too. You don't know how many people are going to be. I wrote on it. Who's going Unless anyone has a specific discussion question, we're going to move on to action items. Let's move. All right. Mr. President, I'd like to move <coughs> items A1 through 5 and A7 through 8. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion on items A1 through A5 and A7 through A9? A9. Nine, Wait, can we have a vote? A9, 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 A9,
filled in since the last uh, or the meeting two weeks ago. Uh, any discussions on items, uh, resolutions D1 through D7? Can you just um, yes. say what the Flower Strip Scholarship Fund is? <laughs> Oh, but he was last year, I think. Too. <laughs> 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 I think your money comes the year before. Too. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually hit Peter with the same question before the meeting started. So go ahead. No, go ahead. About five years ago, we received a um, request. donation request through a will. Uh, Clara Strupp was a, an employee here at one point. Board member opened up the uh, German school that was here for so uh, I don't know how many years, quite a bit. And she willed uh, X amount of dollars in the neighborhood of 40000 to the school for scholarships. Um, we changed banks and we authorized the changing of that. The only thing I forgot to do was the signatures for the account were, was myself and Tom DeGancy. As much as I love Tom and would love to have him come back and sign checks, um, we had to change that to, to Liz. So it's just myself and Liz. And we, it's essentially, the, the resolution is an authorization for the signers, but we're moving the monies from TD Bank to PPAC with everything else. Right. Uh, that particular scholarship is going to be a discussion item at some point in the future because it's restrictive. Uh, the terms are uh, hard for us to meet, and we're talking to attorneys as we speak mm -hmm. to figure out how to make them less restrictive mm -hmm. and yet honor the will. Mm -hmm. More to come on that one. <laughs> a question on D6. What are the licenses for? Mike, Mike <laughs> this is, um, it's essentially for everything. It's for all the students and teachers, uh, but they, they make us pay for just the faculty, the staff, but it covers everything. But what software is it? Oh, it might, it's the Microsoft. I know Microsoft makes a lot of software. I mean, it's, it's everything. It's I, the whole. I thought it was the whole Microsoft yeah, the package. Whole, mm -hmm. That's, That's the way it was explained to me. For like 365, they don't use Office 365. Right. It's for the, whichever one is on all. It's it's for all of the Microsoft. So Windows, Windows, Windows comes with yeah. the PCs. So. It's for the whole suite for it's everything PCs, on the VDI. It's not. Yet. It's not a, we even though we have the Chromebooks, we still have access to all of the, on the VDI of all the Microsoft programs. Okay, I mean, it's just, it's an OS that comes with whatever PCs you buy. You have to pay separate. We have to pay for the license every year, right? The site license? That's my understanding. We push it through. If you remember, though, with the VDI, we push it out to everything, so. Um, in fact, even, you know who's <coughs> charging us now, too, is that Adobe is now starting to get us. Yes. Monthly. Which stinks. Yes. Adobe's monthly. You have no choice on that. We did for years. Yes. They didn't charge us. I now they're starting to hit us with the fee. Acrobat. Yeah. The, all their. Yeah, but I mean, the one that everyone uses is Acrobat. So they first are. and the first time they hit us in midstream, we <laughs> it became a problem because no one could read the PDFs and the teachers were. Well, the we knew right away because they were like, hey, "We can't, we can't open the anything." The reader is always free, always has been. The higher level of Adobe Pro and Adobe XI, they, those you pay monthly for now. Yep. But you can create a PDF right out of Google Drive, right out of Gmail, right out of anything now you can do that. It even work. So you don't need the higher yeah. level Acrobat. Just letting you know that. Cool. I just wanted to know what yeah. Microsoft software you're <coughs> paying through the nose for again. <laughs> Any other discussion on D1 through D7? Can we have a roll call vote, please, Mr. Steins? Ms. Barone? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Mr. Vizio? Yes. Mr. Fahey? Yes. Mr. Hayek? Yes. Mr. Hunsinger? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mr. Fallon? Yes. The motion's carried. We're now at the second opportunity for public comment, which is not limited to agenda items. If you'd like to address the board, please step up to the microphone and state your name and what town you're from. <laughs> we know that though. I was glad to see that I'm not the only one that gets beat up in meetings tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Barry, Barry knows who you are, but I don't. Um, 
what I do want to say. If Could say we have your name? name? Oh, yeah. excuse me. Sorry. Bill Nels, watch out. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> what I do want to say to everyone here is that I want to say thank you for your time and the amount of time you put in for volunteering. I know it's a lot. Uh, it's a very thankless job. And uh, I do appreciate everything you've done for the school system and for our children. I have a daughter in this school system. And she loves it here. She's thriving here. And I hope to see it continue. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and your efforts. Thank, thank you, you for your comments. <laughs> Both yeah, girls they and boys won. Good. Yeah, and the good. boys won as well. So oh, great. Good, good evening. <coughs> okay. The girls are, uh, Anybody else have other business? Yeah. Besides uh, what was talked about tonight, or can you entertain conversations on what parents talked about tonight? If you'd like to have conversations, we can. I'd just like to get the board's opinion on people's take. Do you think they were talking about winning or they were talking about the character of a program? Character I think, of a program. And I think that, that that goes to some of the decisions that the board might have to make to either fund the programs or all programs differently or not. You know, I, I, I heard some things that the parents said that I don't know, which is true, could be just fictional myths that they pick up and listen to. But the key thing that jumped out at me was the, the growing participation of that program of where it's gone over the years. And is that because of Rich or is that because of the program as a whole? Is it because of the administration? We have those numbers if you want, actually, for the past several years. We did pull that up today. Do you have that? I have it right here. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Just um, for seven, you want the totals right now? Uh, just, just, just to validate some of their their concerns or. or um, seventeen eighteen this year was one hundred and eleven. Sixteen seventeen was ninety eight. Fifteen sixteen ninety four. Fourteen fifteen one hundred and one. And thirteen fourteen one hundred. So it's only a difference of about ten to fifteen. So is that overall. and then a dip and then yeah. yeah okay and then a rebound. So the low was 94 and then the high is 111 so and that's the range yeah. and the coaching ratio the coaching ratio with paid coaches um is about it, it depends if you look at varsity or freshman and the way they divide it up if you just looked at the whole program and assume they divided the coaches evenly um it's between 11 and 12 to 1 with the volunteer coaches it's about 9 to 1. so it's it's one of the, our lowest coaching ratios of any of our sports do, do we have information on now on, on how it compares to other schools in, in terms of the, the number of coaches that we have? The one th that's, um, we can look to get some of that. What's hard to do, um, what, what is hard to gauge with that is a lot of schools are similar to us that they have a lot of extra volunteer coaches. So yeah, it's I hard to get a real. I, I know Phillipsburg has lots. Yeah, so it's, so that it's hard to get necessarily, you know, an accurate picture because they may have more volunteer coaches, but, um, but that's something we can so certainly get So what they pay on. their coaches as a stipend is different than ours just because of the collective bargaining agreement. Exactly. Can I ask Bruce, what do you mean by funding it differently? I'm not sure what you mean. <coughs> well, maybe, you'll have to answer that if you don't. No, no, no. I think in, in funding it differently is maybe the board has to decide where you want to allocate resources or if we need to allocate more dollars to that side. You know, for whatever reason, the athletic side or based on the education side. You can debate what's better, athletics, education. I just think some of the frustration that some people have is that this is the first we're hearing about some of these concerns within that football program. And maybe if the board knew some of the, the concerns or the parents' concerns, we might have made or, or at least had a discussion about finding a way, possibly working with Rich, talking with Rich, or talking to the football program about what could be done. Well, that, that one, one of the things I meant to say that I forgot to say was the information about friction with the board yes. was, was something new and... Completely new. Completely and, new. And what board member talked to the football coach that there would be friction? 
Nobody. No. Nobody. Nobody. I think it's just the confu probably the confusion among them is seeing kind of the board and the administration as, as one. one entity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it, I think That's we also I there was no friction that. between uh, with administration either though. No. I mean, I think we, None. Rich was very well respected and liked, I, so I, that's not I, accurate. I, I would love every program we have at the school, academic co-curricular, to have a gazillion dollars. That would be my wish, but in reality, that's not a reality. There's the Touchdown Club is a 501c3 registered. We are totally outside of our purview. Have we ever denied any spending that they've wanted well, to do? Well, they can't pay the coaches, so we have denied that. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're not allowed to. <laughs> Maybe that's but, what they were but talking that's, about. That, that again, is outside of our okay. control yeah. as a board, yeah, right? A good but <laughs> if that's what they're talking about, that we can answer. I think I did answer that. Yeah. Right. I, we can't, we're we're you can't. restricted by the right. collective bargaining. Right. We can't break the law. Right. Now, well, the law is based on our collective bargaining agreement. Well, right. I think in other... We also do have it in the Booster Club policy that they cannot supplement right. coaching right. salaries or pay volunteer coaching salaries. So well, they violate the collective bargaining agreement. Yes. So right. now, what if the coaches weren't part of that? I don't think the union would ever allow no, it. No, but... but it, <laughs> yeah, that. But again, we yeah. have it. But in the policy, but in the policy, it says it explicitly says in the policy that the booster clubs cannot use their funds right. to supplement coaching salaries. Right. So. <laughs> Just Jill, I'd like to say yes. The board sets priorities, but we shouldn't consider you know, the, the, the squeaky wheel. The last person mm -hmm. who came before us yelling mm -hmm. and screaming. We have a lot to consider. And I do want to point out, as I mentioned to Mr. Aronia, we have fixed costs. We have very high fixed costs. It doesn't matter that our budget is $36 million. 46. We, 46. 46. <laughs> Sorry. Who's $10 million? Like early days days. We have been very yeah, fortunate in the last couple of years in our decisions concerning our health insurance plans. The union has worked with us, and we've been able to save costs. But that's not, and we just joined that health insurance plan, we save costs. Yeah. This is not the way it will always be going forward. We can see increases every year of 15% in our health insurance premiums, and we have a 2% cap. So everyone has to keep that in mind when they're throwing around, we'll throw money here and throw money there, because you have to keep this all in, and consider all our fixed costs. And, and with the size of our budget, a, a 15 to 17% increase in health insurance costs takes up more than the cap raise no, each year. Right. right. And, so, and, al and also, you know, we just had an operations committee meeting where we're discussing if our demographics can continue to decline, how we'll deal with that as a board. So, you know, these are things that we are proactively discussing. Right. So just to throw money is right. not a realistic. And of course, if, I'm sorry. But, oh, I'm sorry. I don't think I you're, I don't I don't think think you're just arbitrarily throwing money. They're, they're, they're asking you to look at the program, evaluate the program, and see where improvements could be made. To your point, with the demographics decreasing, we shouldn't just be looking at athletics. We should be looking at co-curricular activities, our courses we offer, our electives we offer, the levels we offer. That's what we should be we discussing. Are. We are. But I'm hearing that you don't want to talk about athletics. I, I don't, I don't, know I don't think we're saying that. That's what we okay. were talking about. Let's stop up what we have to say. To me, there's no sacred cow. So the, 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 the question that I have, I mean, there's, and it's not a matter of, I, th I think, squeaky wheel, you know, although there, you know, certainly mm. this is, <laughs> no, but I mean, just hear me out. Uh, you know, there's, there, there seems to be a gap between, you know, there's some things that we need to look at and people walking out the door, right? As, as far as, you know, what we know, I mean, the first I heard about there being anything was when we got the email on, on Friday. And, you know, if, it, if the administration was taken by surprise, which they shared with us when this happened earlier, you know, how can we go from everything's fine mm -hmm. to, you know, a coach walking out the door and everything's not fine? I mean, there's, there's a huge gap there that I'm struggling to understand, which leads me to my question, which is, have we done a program evaluation where we look at all aspects of how we're operating either all of our athletic programs or maybe if that's too much to do at one time, we begin to focus on taking a couple programs a year to see how, how do we stack up on 
coaching, on salaries, on support, on other things, so that we have, so that we will know as a board confidently that yes, we are doing the things to make sure that 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 these programs are supported to the degree that we can within the confines that we have to work. I thought we did that over the last well, couple Well, that's what years. I'm asking, because I don't know. Because we went through all the sports and coaching levels to see, you know, number of students in the, in the, in the sport, yep. number of coaches, right. yes. and we went yes. through mm -hmm. all of that yep. mm -hmm. two years in a row, and we arrived at what we had. Mm -hmm. I don't think the number of coaches is the issue. I think it's the Stipend. The stipend that the assistant coaches are paid, which we can't change. But uh, uh, my expression of a program evaluation is more extensive than, you know, just You're the talking number of about coaches. having Chris go focus on one sport I want, I want, and, and report back. You know, are, the, the, are we supporting it to the level that a, you know, a similar type of school? I don't, you can't necessarily have us compare to Westfield because we're not Westfield. Right. And know? we did do that. We're a regional. Okay, well, that's, yeah, that's what did. I'm looking yeah. for. But the other issue really is, let's take money out of the picture. It's a program component of wrestling. There's a lot of support. Basketball, there's a lot of support. Like in terms of, in terms of people supporting the program, and I don't mean parent support, I mean the whole issue of why are those, maybe those coaches staying and this coach not? They're all getting paid the same amount of money. What is football? Why do football coaches have to get paid more money than basketball coaches? I, I mean, Perhaps it's not every single coach kicks leaves out of out of out of um, frustration for a stipend. Some of them are staying. Why? And that might be a cultural a culture issue, um, like you would think of in culture of learning. I don't know. I mean, there might be other in terms of programmatic. I don't know necessarily that it's always just an issue of money. Um, so that. And again, I'm new here. I've and I don't have and I don't follow the football. I don't really follow most of the sporting programs. But I can tell you, people in my ear, I've heard people in my ear go, football gets all the money. They get all the perks. So, so, so I hear that you. on one side, and then you hear the other one on the other side. I mean, <laughs> so I think there is some perception issues, hence why I think that all these questions that I brought up before need to be answered so we can clear the perception issues, be all on the same page. These are the facts, folks. Well, part of, I think part of the perception is that football gets a lot more money when in fact a lot of it's equipment that we need to have for safety. And plus there's 111 kids and so those helmets and pads and all that kind of stuff is not cheap to own, not cheap to care for, and not cheap to recondition. And you know, a lot of the stuff that they see the kids have, some of it is paid for by the touchdown club, not the coaches. But so people's perception is, oh look, these guys get all this stuff, but some of that's not out of our budget. Right, but I'm you just know, saying they see the amount helmets. of coaches, they see the amount of coaches, they yeah. see the ratios. People look at this stuff. Yeah, well, I'm just going to stand up for football for a second. It's across the board. We're paying tens of thousands of dollars to rent ice for an ice hockey team. So how many guys are playing on that team? Not, you know, per capita, we're spending more, I think, for ice hockey to each play than for football. Now, for wrestling, again, Atlantic City was sending down, what, three wrestlers with Hopefully it's like four wrestlers with three yeah. coaches. How many coaches? No, there might be It's more. like one yeah. on, is it going to be one to one? I mean, and that's a big expense too. So yeah. it's across the board with sports. There's a lot but of what, money but what I'm saying is the there. perception is football gets more when they probably well, don't. Well, right. a lot of money's being thrown at sports. I'm just saying there's a lot of perceptual mm -hmm. issues and, and questions, and that's why I think it's mm -hmm. best if we have the facts and we present the facts as they are versus allowing the perceptions to rule. Yeah, I think the perceptions have to be looked at and changed in all of them. I just have one other other business issue. Um, I went to the DEAC committee. Yes. Am I supposed to report on that next time? Is that something yes. that comes up? Yes, okay. we will ask you to I didn't know if that, that was one of those reporting committees or, or not. I didn't know exactly. That, yep. Sorry. Thank you. No, just keep That'll fall on the representative yeah. report. <laughs> <laughs> or I didn't know if Beth did yeah, the reporting. That's on. really what I was asking. <laughs> No, you get to do that. You make Beth write it. And then you I can even do this. Yeah, thank you. I just have a quick question um, yes. since I'm here to try and look. What exactly is the communications committee doing that? Because if I'm hearing there's a lot of misconception mm. on where the money is going, communication between faculty, administration. What can the board do to try and remedy this? This is what the third coach in the last four years has resigned. Why is that despite the funding hasn't changed? 
what is what is the role of the communications committee and how can that be improved? I, I don't understand what the commu communication committee does. That, that was an ad hoc committee formed last year for the communications <coughs> audit. So now we're working with the, the results of the communications audit. So there's not a specific committee for that. Um, but each board committee does deal directly with those issues. So, you know, operations deals with communication regarding the budget, education, to, you know, works on communication regarding um, different curricular and education issues. So anything related to, to their particular um, kind of area of, of oversight. So and, and, and let me just also add that the idea behind Rita's summary of questions after I, I went through some of them is to have us get, let us have a list so that Liz and Tim can bring answers back to us and we'll report it we'll to Brenda and the two other people who will be at next, next week's mm -hmm. meeting or the next meeting in two weeks. And I can also tell you that some of the things that were brought up tonight, um, I, I'm confused as to why they were brought up because conversations <laughs> and emails were exchanged between those folks and administrators here so they were given correct information, um, but the information that was shared publicly was still inaccurate information so but that sometimes happens but I, I think what we want to do is is at the next meeting hopefully by the next no, meeting the is, is have some information that we put out on the record that'll be on you know on our on our videos as well for people mm -hmm. to see and you know we can then have a discussion if we need to about whether we need to have additional communication beyond that is there a way we could better bring that out to the public through social media or some way because and not, I know many people don't really go through the Board of Education website or look at the videos. They go, I, w I would say that TAP is where many people get their um, information. I well, Brenda pushes it out. Yeah. This is a so, great job at it. Though. Yeah, and the echoes. So um, they all get that. And all of our board meetings are online as well. And, and most of us are not as adept at social media as you are. <laughs> and, and so I don't know that we're going to, uh, you know, dedicate resources and staff to, to putting well, that out. And know. even more than that, Peter, we talked about as a board yes. last year, Thank you. Um, social media in terms of who's really going to monitor and maintain this. And we didn't feel that we really had the resources available for specific social media that, you know, all of a sudden someone, someone says something and someone says something else and who amongst us is going to maintain and run that. Um, so, you know, it's, I'm not going to say it's a challenge. I just think that as a board so far, we've decided not to go the route of social media. I mean, the only other thing would be is if we all wanted to have another committee. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, something like something like this pops up, you'd, you'd have a full-time person yeah. working 24-7, yeah. you know, yeah. Re yeah. responding I mean, to that. We, you know. The board I was on, you know, Long Hill is smaller, but we yeah. always had that committee, that communications committee. Didn't always get, it wasn't always the best way of evaluating and trying to get communications out. Sometimes we used to, we talked about it during board retreats. It's definitely a conversation that we should continue to have and try to figure out what is the best way to make sure that these misceptions are clear. But it's going to happen. It, well, you know, based the misperceptions will happen. Maybe you should spearhead that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking French. I can imagine. So <laughs> like we're together on this. We're on the same page. It's like we don't need an administrator to do this. It's so like, we're it's, volunteers. It's like you know, um, we're going to wait till next year. And at the reorg meeting, when Bruce isn't yet appointed from Greenbrook, we're going to assign it to him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if we get pick up one, we have to get rid of one. That's the deal with the committees. So we got to trade. Yeah. No, the other thing that just pretty so you know that came back in the communications audit um, that the consultant you know was um, she we, does we this ever is that social that. media is not where people get their information when they're looking for school information. It's not, it doesn't because it cha and the the reasoning behind right. it is it changes so rapidly. Everyone had you know there's always something new coming out that that's not really where people go for um, the information that they're looking for. The so, audit is in the, in our My Documents, right? So if Freddie wanted to look at the audit. Yep. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's, in the, it's in Google Drive. Well, yeah. people yeah. don't, yeah. they don't really go look for information anymore. They wait for it to come to mm -hmm. them. On Facebook, and then they all have their own ideas of what actually happens, and they will get pushed to them. And they'll determine uh, whether it's coming from a real source or not a real source. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think there should be a better presence. So, uh, I mean, change the subject? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, uh, you know, on the other business area, the uh, Senator Sweeney introduced S1. Uh, S1 is his uh, municipal and government entity consolidation bill, uh, which, uh, you know, has already passed out of the Senate committee and is now moving to the full Senate. 
uh, which will probably come out of there, and who knows what will happen in the assembly, whether they'll even post it at that mm. point in time. But uh, it's an opportunity, again, you know, get this back on the front burner, the work that we need to be doing as a board and having conversations with our sending committees around the ways that we can be looking at shared services. Because one of the things that this bill is looking to do is move <coughs> beyond suggesting it and, and actually mandating it and mandating it in such a way that if you do not you know, take their direction seriously that for the dollars that they perceive that you should be able to save, they will withhold that from mm. your state funding. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, again, not that we needed more incentive because we were already going down that road wanting to have those conversations. I think we should have begin, yes. you know, to have those sooner rather than later. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things that it may be worth paying attention to in lobbying is, is in, in the past when, when the state has had these sort of efforts, you often didn't get credit for what you had already been doing in shared services, and you were expecting to, to build upon that regardless of what you'd already done. So that, that's, that's a pitfall for those of us who've already started doing that. Uh, I'm going to suggest that, the, that we not go back into to private session tonight and that we save it for the next meeting. Partially, Greg will be here as well and, and had an issue with that. If that's okay with everybody. Okay. Okay. Anyone, any other business? Then I'll entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. All right. Aye. Aye.